This is a picture from the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Ebola virus is back. It's now over 2,200 cases. It's crossed an international border, and it's in a region with militant activity and 300,000 refugees. This new outbreak occurs just a couple of years after a massive one, which occurred at a different site in West Africa, a thousand miles away, that expanded to 30,000 people in eight countries from a single infected toddler. In the face of a pandemic like this, we need therapies. We need scientists like me to come up with these therapies. Okay, well, how are scientists to respond to a pandemic like that? Well, we must work faster. We must work smarter. We must work together. Now, it seems obvious that we must do these three things, work faster and smarter and together. But can we do them all at the same time? In particular, while it seems obvious that we must work together, in the face of a mounting crisis and in a race against this pandemic, can the effort required to organize into a group compromise speed and innovation? Plus, we all know instances in which a group and groupthink have stifled viable individual voices, like the villagers turned into a mob, or why is that piece of public art so awful? Well, it was chosen by a committee. <laughs> so, this is especially true for scientific research, where competition is the norm, because competition drives innovation. Competition and the race to publish gets results faster. In the face of a growing pandemic like this, the trouble is that for curing Ebola, or even something like curing cancer, it's not a straight-shot race in a straight line with a finish line in sight. Right? Fighting Ebola virus is a maze, and it's a maze filled with traps. We need people with different skill sets to solve this problem. We need strategies to work together and contribute our skills and resources to achieve a greater good. In the face of a growing pandemic, can we find a space in which competition, which is what drives research and which what will persist in research, and collaboration, which is what we need to combine the skill sets to get new directions, can we find a space, how can we find the space, in which competition and collaboration can simultaneously coexist? I'd like to tell you about a project we started six years ago, in which 45 previously competing research labs across five continents galvanized together into a singular effort to understand and defeat Ebola virus and other infectious diseases. I'd like to tell you why we needed to form this group, precisely how we did it, and what the outcomes were. So first, the why, the science. Ebola virus is shaped like a long, flexible strand of spaghetti. Infection causes fever, diarrhea, vomiting, hemorrhage. 40 to 90 percent of the people infected will die within two weeks of the onset of symptoms. How does it infect cells? Well, studied into the surface of the virus is a protein, this light blue tree. That protein will attach to your human cell and with an action like a spring-loaded trap, drive itself inside. How do we defend against it? Well, that surface protein is the target of your immune defenses. In particular, Molecules called antibodies will seek out that virus, attach to it, and neutralize it, and then tag it for destruction by your white blood cells. So, how does this antibody-mediated protection work? Well, I am an antibody. An antibody is shaped like a Y. An antibody has two arms and a base. At the end of the arms are fingers, very specific fingers that fit into a very specific shape. That specificity of that shape recognition is as unique as fingerprint recognition, because the genes that encode those antibody responses are combinatorial. There are billions of possibilities, allowing for individual antibodies that precisely target one particular place on one particular pathogen, be it measles or polio or Ebola. By seeking out and latching onto that surface protein, those antibodies could block its ability to attach to your cells, 
or lock that spring-loaded trap in place so the virus can't get in. And then, by binding, that antibody has tagged the immune, or tagged the virus or infected cell for destruction by the immune system. So that specificity is key. Understanding that specificity is key to finding the right antibody. If you find the right antibody, it's incredibly powerful. So you've all heard of gamma globulin delivered after a rabies bite. That's antibody. Antibodies are powerful enough you can deliver them like a drug, like gamma globulin. If you give somebody antibody, you've given them immediate immunity. If you can find the right antibody to deliver, you can save a life. And so the challenge is finding the right antibody to deliver. Now, what the scientific research pipeline was is we had focused on those precise combinatorial fingers, and we had evaluated the ability of those fingers to anchor onto Ebola virus and neutralize it in test tubes or little plastic dishes, because we had thought that the ability of that antibody to neutralize the virus in the test tubes would forecast its ability to protect a living thing. But we were wrong. We had antibodies that looked brilliant in test tubes, but they didn't save the lives of living things. And we had other antibodies that would protect living things, but they didn't register any activity at all in the test tubes. So what are we supposed to do? We don't need to save test tubes from Ebola virus. <laughs> we need to save people from Ebola virus. So we had a moment of humility. Where we had to recognize, as a scientific field, that we did not know how protection against Ebola virus could be achieved, and we didn't know what experiment we should do to find a protective antibody. So this was a big problem, and a big problem requires a big solution. And so here's what I thought: at that point in time, we'd only looked at a couple of antibodies or a couple of samples, and I thought maybe we just didn't have a broad enough view of what was out there. It wasn't statistically meaningful, and the other thing was that what did work was a combination therapy. It was three antibodies put together. Okay, well, against Ebola virus, you want the best combination therapy, and what if the best combination therapy turned out to be one antibody discovered in Washington and one antibody discovered in Paris, plus one antibody discovered in Tokyo? Yeah, well, you'd never know about that combination unless you had them all in the same room together. So how are we going to do that? Well, I thought, well, what if we could? What if we could get all the different Ebola virus scientists in the world to send their antibodies to one place? We could just line up everybody's samples on the table and look at them side by side and figure out what was best. And while we had all the samples, what if we could get all the brains? Because all the scientists in the field each had a different kind of expertise, or they're asking a different question, or they use a different experiment to look at a different feature of the antibodies. What if we could get all those brains and all those different disciplines together, analyzing that same set of samples? We'd have a really broad view, and we should be able to come to some meaningful results, right?、We'd、get everyone to hand over all their published and unpublished information, lay it out for all their competitors to look at. Great idea, Pollyanna. <laughs> okay, how is this going to work? We designed the study with an ironclad agreement. The samples would all be codenamed. They'd be blinded. Nobody would know whose antibodies were whose. Everything would come in and be renamed sample 45, sample 132. We would never reveal its identity. This made the study very fair. Nobody could advocate for their own antibody. It also protected that scientist's ability to publish, because you've heard of publish or perish, right? If you've invested years coming up with a set of scientific research results and you hand over that information to your competitor, you might not be able to publish your paper. Plus, there's intellectual property. Even if the scientist wanted to share, the legalities between institutions to make that happen can be just too long and drawn out. And so, we needed a framework that would encourage this collaboration and sharing while protecting intellectual property and protecting an investigator's ability to publish all in a rapid timescale. By blinding everything, we protected that scientist's ability to write his own paper because we didn't know the antibody's name, we didn't know its sequence, we just knew it was number 45. And really, what we were doing, we we're looking at the population and samples of different kinds of things and how protection was in general achieved. So, with that agreement in place that protected everyone's ability to publish and protected intellectual property, the consortium was born. So we had 45. 
previously competing laboratories across academia, industry, and government, across five continents, united to do this study. Now, what happened was this. Everybody sent their published and unpublished antibodies to one location, where they're all blinded. And then we packed identical box sets of the world's antibodies together. And we sent each identical box out to a different partner in the study. And we said, whatever you do to study antibodies, whatever your expertise is, whatever you're really good at, you do that in the same set. So everyone's going to do whatever it is their expertise is using their experiment on the same set of antibodies, and we're going to gather back in La Jolla, California, and put the data back together. So what did we gather? We gathered the broadest and most comprehensive data set yet available for antibodies against Ebola virus. Using all of these different experiments and looking at all the different features of the antibodies, we were able to figure out which features of the antibodies tracked with other features and which features correlated with protection and which experiments we should do to find the best antibodies faster next time. What did we learn? What we learned was that what we had been missing all along was the activity of the base of that antibody the ability of that antibody to recruit your immune system, your white blood cells, your immune sentries and scavengers to come in and clear the virus or clear the infected cells from the body. That that was the missing piece of protection, and we now had experiments that we could use to better find it and better design it. Now, what was important was we only saw this because we had the broad and comprehensive data set in everybody's samples. We could see the pattern across all of them. Had we each only looked at our own samples, we never would have seen it. We only got this insight because we did a large collective study. Now, the size and breadth and depth of that data set also helped us counteract another thing that can plague large organizations, which is groupthink. Because we had a broader and deeper data set and could do statistical analysis on it, we could be more objective. We were also more objective for another reason. Because we had studied antibodies that were discovered in and selected by and donated by different labs, each using different criteria, we were able to survey a greater, broader, a broader um, analysis of what was available to immunology. So we were able to achieve a more objective, more diverse study. So we avoided groupthink. We came up with new routes to protection. How did we avoid the other problem that could plague a large organization? And that's speed, right? When cases double every two weeks, we got to operate quickly. We sought to counteract that by designing the study in a two-pronged approach, kind of a tortoise and the hare. The fast-track study, a couple of labs with some promising initial candidates would just mix and match their samples and try to come up with a better combination therapy than either one of them had alone. They did it, and they did it during the outbreak. And that therapy was mobilized into people and saved lives just a few months after it was discovered. That's fast. Now, that comprehensive study, in which we analyzed all the samples and all the features, it gave us new routes to protection. It informed the next generation of therapeutics and it revised the research pipeline. But it was also more efficient in another way. Because the way research typically works is that a group of scientists will get some results, write the paper, publish the paper. The second group will read the paper, confirm the results, write their paper. The third group will then confirm the results, or maybe there's an argument about the data, but it takes some time. Plus, confirming someone else's results probably isn't the top priority of the second and third lab, so it takes a little more time yet. Okay, but in this comprehensive study, we had all the experts operating at once. Everybody was doing their different technique and their confirmatory strategy in the same set of data all at once. So we had experiment, confirmation, and reconfirmation happening all at the same time. And so we could accelerate with a certain amount of speed and efficiency. So we together were able to come up with a better, broader data set that gave us information that we could all use and it gave us new therapies we could use going forward. But why else did people participate? Well, I might be the one standing here talking to you today, but it was the outstanding character of the individual scientists in that consortium that gave the group its collective power. We started this group in 2013. 
in anticipation that one day that big outbreak might come. At that time, the field was small, and I knew everybody in it, and I knew that these were passionate scientists committed to making that therapy available, that they had seen what that disease looked like, they could see how quickly it, am it could amplify, and they knew that therapy had to exist. When we wrote that program, we thought we needed to be prepared in case that outbreak might come. What we didn't realize was how quickly it would come. The National Institutes of Health funded our study in March 2014, which was three months after patient zero, that toddler, was infected at an ultimately 30,000-person outbreak. So suddenly, we were running this research study as the cases were doubling every two weeks in Western Africa. And as our own colleagues with whom we had worked and shared meals for years were getting infected and dying. And then it got personal. This was the Ebola crisis, and we were the Ebola scientists. And suddenly, this was something much bigger than ourselves. So it was a grand idea on a grand scale. Did it work? Well, how do you measure success? The measurable outcomes were these. 78 peer-reviewed scientific papers from the consortium. 10 PhDs granted from research performed by the consortium. And six new candidate antibody therapies put in place for infectious diseases where there was no therapy before. Each of these accelerated or discovered or launched in some way by this consortium. And importantly, some of these are being evaluated side by side right now, today, in a clinical trial in the Democratic Republic of the Congo in that ongoing outbreak. So all of those therapies and all that information now exists when none of that existed a couple of years ago. We aren't the first people to work together, and we won't be the last. What's unique about this group was that we formed in anticipation of that large outbreak, and then we ran that study during that large outbreak. But what's broadly applicable here is the model in which we navigated the complexities of intellectual property, individual will, individual motivation, allocation of resources, credit, and ideas. That's something that's broadly applicable to other organizations. Infectious disease will come again and again. For curing cancer or curing hunger, people have and will continue to need to band together and combine resources and expertise for the greater good. What I want to leave you with is that mobilization of such a thing is possible. Given the right framework and opportunity and resources, people can and will collaborate for the greater good. <laughs>